I have a sentence in my mind from the first day that children uh, are not future, but today citizens. And I think that is the base of our work, the right of the child. So I'm very much honored to, and privileged to introduce you our last plenary keynote speaker, Maria Herr, for the United Nations Com Committee, and also the chair of Eurochild, which is, a, which is an umbrella organization uh, um, collecting 35 international organizations working on child's rights. So uh, I think when we are talking about early childhood development, we always have to consider the right of the child. That's the base of our work. So last but not least, I'm calling Maria Herzog. I'm giving her the floor, and I would like her to give her speech. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful introductory words. Um, however, I, I'm absolutely sure that you must be very exhausted and very tired after these many years, many years, yeah. not mentioning the years, also the years and the days now. Um, we are very lucky with the weather, so I hope that you will have a free and joyful afternoon and you take with you all the thoughts. So I would like to talk about um, child rights, that's true, however I have to say that Eva was talking about Euro child and I just don't want you to miss it, that it's, we are operating in 35 countries, so it's not only the EU, and we've got over 140 member organizations on child rights, child poverty and social exclusion issues, and many of our member organizations' representatives are here, so I'm really delighted to uh, see them, and I only hope that many others will come and join us in the um, future. <clears throat> So concerning the early childhood issues, if I can yeah, find my uh, button to push. Uh, I don't want to go into the details of the convention, obviously, as you are all aware of it. But what is very important from the early childhood uh, perspective that all children, including very young children, are right holders. And this is very often overlooked because when we are talking about children, only those children are counted who are mature enough, whatever it means, to exercise their rights. But we all know that uh, children are entitled to social protection and uh, nurturing from the first, days of, first day of their life, and they also should be listened to, because we know that even, as it was already said in one of the workshops, newborns can very clearly express themselves. So they give us very clear indications on their needs, on their wishes, and if we are reflecting on these needs uh, and we understand them, learn their language from the first day of life, then we can expect them to also respect us. Because then it means that we give them the impression that they are important, they have rights, they have a right to express themselves, they have a right to protection, to nurturing, they have a right to um, exercise their rights in a way that they are not hurt in any way. So we are protecting them from all forms of violation, from discrimination in any form. And this means that they are learning from us through our practice and our modeling uh, behavior how to uh, become independent, very strong individuals who can protect themselves, but who are also respecting others' rights. So this is why we are saying in this child rights word that despite of the very strong push from many politicians and sadly enough even from many practitioners and parents, it's not it, it, the right <coughs> list of issues is first the rights and then the obligations and not the, the other way around. And the reason for that is that if children are aware of their rights and they can exercise their rights, then to say automatically they can <laughs> learn about their responsibilities and obligations because they see also from us adults uh, how we proceed. Children are not learning from the words we are telling them, as you know, but from the actions they are monitoring and from our behavior, and this is the most important thing. Now, in the United uh, Nations uh, Convention on the Rights, uh, as it was said yesterday by Kathleen, um, 
We are celebrating the 25th anniversary on the 20th of November, so there are many, many celebrations this year, ESA also, and uh, um, um, the Open Societies uh, programs, but also the convention is 25 years um, in, on the uh, 20th of November. There is no clear indication on young children, but every child between 0 and 18 is covered by the convention, so it uh, includes very clearly um, children as right holders, um, as a human, based on the fact that they are human beings as anyone else, and they are, chil uh, they are children. On the other hand, what is very important in the convention, that the parents are the primary caregiver of the children, and therefore we have to take into consideration their duties and responsibilities. However, very often, the state parties are not looking at the second point of this Article 18, which is speaking about the primary responsibility of the parents, and don't like to read the second point saying that the state has to provide all the possible support to the parents to fulfill their obligations. And this is very important, because this means uh, that there is a very clear uh, indication on the um, uh, state um, responsibilities. Now, we had in 2005, a so-called general day of discussion. This is organized by the committee. It used to be every year, now it's in every uh, second year, when we are discussing specific issues in relation to the convention and try to consult with a wide array of NGOs, experts, UN agencies um, who are coming to Geneva. And in the Palais de Nation, they are, um, they are discussing uh, throughout the day a specific child rights-based issue so that we can give recommendations to the state parties and also we can consult with our colleagues on how to proceed when we are discussing with the state parties the different issues concerning uh, children. Now in 2005 there was an extremely important uh, discussion on early childhood and this was followed by the preparation a so-called general comment. The general comments are the documents prepared by the committee with the help of experts and NGOs, uh, where we are again focusing on specific issues that are either not clarified clearly in the convention or need more clarification. We've got 17 such general comments so far, and the last was one of the most peculiar and most interesting and tricky one on the best interest of the child issue last year. But in 2005, following the uh, general day of discussion, there was a decision that we need a general comment on early childhood because early childhood has overlooked very often even by the state parties in their reports and um, in their activities. So what we know, but it is worth to look at, that there is, and it, we heard it in the previous uh, uh, presentation, and I don't want to repeat that, that there is a whole pool of activities that are needed to enhance the well-being of children and to ensure that their rights are considered, and that it means that children are not only investment into the future, but they have a right to enjoy their childhood now. And we have to somehow provide all the needed uh, conditions and circumstances for that. So how can we ensure child rights for early, early childhood? First of all, I guess, um, and I don't go into the details because we, then we could stay until tomorrow at least, to talk about the responsibilities and the shared responsibilities between families, communities, um, and, um, and um, the state parties and the civil society. As far as I see, no way in the world neither in the developed nor in the developing world, is there a clear understanding or how is the share of responsibility set? And this is leading to a lot of confusion. In most instances, families are blamed and shamed, while the community, the civil society, and the state uh, should have a responsibility to ensure that every child who was born has got right to a happy childhood and to a um, healthy upbringing. Now, obviously, there are many arguments we can use and in most instances, economic arguments are used by saying that it's worth investing into children. And I will come to, uh, back to this later. But what we have to also say, that it is not only and not primarily an economic and political argument, it should be a child rights-based argument, that children 
are entitled to a happy childhood and to healthy and uh, the fullest possible um, upbringing. So we should, I guess, and this could be an interesting uh, uh, conference topic to do at the division of these responsibilities and how the cooperation between these actors could uh, be done. And I just want to encourage you, although I know that this was a very, very detailed and exciting conference, to come and join Eurochild uh, in November in Bucharest, Romania, where we are organizing our annual conference and our topic is uh, uh, budgeting expenditure of the state and the allocation of the resources on children, which is one of the most important tools to measure how this responsibility is um, divided or taken into consideration. Obviously, young children, just like any other groups of children, but they are even more, especially in uh, certain uh, vulnerable situations, and we should focus, and during these three days there has been a lot um, said about the vulnerable uh, groups of children who are in need of special attention, more, more resources, and much, much more attention. Uh, and they are very often uh, not viewed as the right holders, rather as a burden or a problem for the communities and uh, for the state. Another very delicate issue is the respect of the views and feelings of young children, which is the Article 12 in the Convention, as everybody knows. And when it comes to young children, it is extremely hard to make the uh, policymakers, politicians, but oftentimes even professionals and parents, to understand that children should be listened to. Not because it's a right, but it's because it's worth it. Because if we are listening to children, we understand their needs, they can express their views, Sometimes they are evaluating our activities. This is also very useful, not always pleasant, but it's good to know, and it's a good feedback. It's like a quality assurance. We know what children think of us better to know than if they are not telling us. And also, uh, when it comes to young children, there are so many forms, and you know much better than I do, that there are many, many different ways on how we can strengthen this kind of activity of children so they learn that they can and should express their views and they are listened to, so they are not only telling us what they think, but they are also listened to very carefully. And their views are taken into consideration. And there are many, many issues, as we know, when we have to t listen to children uh, and even a two, three years old or even a, a, a baby can very clearly tell us about their needs, and we should respond to, um, uh, to that uh, properly. Now, there is a new tool in the UN, as you probably know, a new optional protocol was approved by the General Assembly of the United uh, Nations uh, um, uh, last year on uh, the individual complaint mechanism. So from the, this year, this April, children can submit individual complaints to the committee or NGOs Special groups uh, can submit in their names complaints to the committee in case their rights are violated. And this is a very controversial issue because obviously on the one hand, this is a wonderful opportunity that children or those representing them can submit complaints. However, the message, the, the symbolic message of this um, new um, um, opportunity is rather to strengthen the local complaint mechanisms, to strengthen the local um, uh, mechanisms where children uh, are given a voice, where they can clearly uh, trust adults around them and be sure that if there is any violation of their rights, then they can get remedy, they can get support, and also they are heard and listened to. And um, you can imagine that the committee will not be able to make in-depth analysis of all these um, complaints once they arrive. And obviously, it needs a lot of ratification from the member states. So far, we've got 11 ratifications only. So only from those countries can we um, get the complaints. But once it's becoming much more universal, I don't think that the main importance of this um, uh, uh, measure or instrument is um, uh, to analyze individual cases at the committee level, rather strengthening the local uh, opportunities. Now, <clears throat> uh, as you all know, and I don't want to go into the details, 
the UN uh, Convention and the Committee is considering uh, early childhood as it is becoming more and more widespread between zero and eight years of age. And it's been said on many occasions during the last day, so I don't want to repeat that this is the most rapid and most determining period of growth and change. We all know that the most efforts, energy, money, and other resources should be uh, invested in this early uh, period, but we don't see that. So the civil society has got an enormous role and the professional organizations to strengthen parents' uh, uh, organizations to somehow strengthen those policies that are acknowledging and also using um, uh, this knowledge because this means that children are having very, very strong and absolutely essential emotional needs, attachment bonding, but also protection and guidance and good um, um, uh, frameworks and uh, rules how to manage um, their life. Now, <clears throat> what, what is the content of the um, GC7, the General Common 7? It is talking, uh, first of all, about, uh, besides the things I was just listing, the resource allocation for early childhood in all means. Also, the need for data uh, collection and management, as it's been said on many um, occasions during these days. Also, research and implementation of outcomes. I find it extremely important uh, that it's not only research what we are doing, but we are also measuring the outcomes. Uh, because oftentimes this is um, just overlooked and there is evidence-based <coughs> practice without real evidence uh, behind it. Also, training the rights of, chi of, the, of the child in early childhood for all, uh, enabling parents to be aware of it and accept it and not being afraid of it. Also, professionals working with... Uh, uh, with young children and their families, and also the children themselves could, ve from a very early age on, learn about their rights. There are many technical and other forms of um, supports uh, provided to the different states uh, internationally who need this kind of implementation um, assistance. And obviously, uh, civil society professionals um, has a primary role in the advocacy when it, come, it becomes to the implementation of rights. Now, what is uh, very interesting that there was an indicator set, set up by, um, led by the committee with the help of many experts. Um, first of all, our dear friend and colleague who sadly enough passed away last year, Professor Clyde Hertzman from British Columbia, Canada, who was the, so to say, the father of this uh, early childhood um, um, general common seven indicator set. In seven clusters and 17 set of indicators, you can see all the elements uh, that should be assessed properly when it comes to the implementation of child rights in early childhood. And two of them are um, especially focusing on early childhood education. The indicator set 13 is looking at the provision of early childhood education and care services focusing on the quality of care, child friendliness, child-centered and child and rights-based service provision. And the 14, which is looking at the educational prov uh, provision for vulnerable young children, focusing on the different needs, access and quality of care again, right to non-discrimination and equal opportunities for all children. So if you are interested in looking at these indicators, then you can see that this is a wonderful opportunity to lobby and, and use this ad as an advocacy tool to convince the policymakers, politicians, to change the legislation, change the professional standards, protocols, or if there is not anything like that, then to establish them. So why are they important? Because um, obviously they are realized. They are they are excellent tools to to test the realization of rights. They can detect the inequalities or adequacy of the legislation and the practice and also the progress, and also help the governments allocate properly the resources. Because in many countries, what we can detect, that is not primarily the lack of uh, adequate resources, resources, but the allocation of the resources and the lack of cooperation between the dif uh, different experts and different sectors, as it's been said previously, are clearly um, jeopardizing many, many good efforts, and they are interfering with um, each other. 
So uh, also there is a new direction, a relatively new direction, looking at the subjective well-being indicators of asking children and asking their opinion about their well-being and also taking it into consideration because this is giving us a, a very clear feedback very often that we have a misunderstanding when it comes to the well-being of children. Obviously, with uh, young children, there hasn't been much done in this area, but with teenagers, it is amazing to see the outcomes. When you are asking children, parents and professionals on the same issues, then parents and, and professionals sometimes, or often, I must say, don't really know what the children close to them or in their care are thinking, although they think they know. So subjective well-being indicators are a wonderful to, a tool to help understand us what the children's needs are and whether we translate and interpret properly their signs or their communication. Now, <clears throat> reporting and recommendations on uh, early childhood education and care and early childhood development has become um, extremely important because uh, um, depending on your activities, depending on the professionals and NGOs activities, when they are submitting their reports to the uh, uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child, the weight of early childhood is always depending on the different actors' activity. And if those working in early childhood development and um, education and care are more active, then they are becoming, and early, then children in early years are becoming much, much more visible. And I guess this is a very important task because that is influencing the committee's work and perception about the needs in the different state parties, also based on the recommendations. You can put a pressure on the local stakeholders to. Uh, uh, to challenge them and help them. So what I would like to show you, my dear daughter-in-law was uh, kind enough and uh, made a proper uh, yeah, table. I'm not very literate in this respect, so I have to thank her for doing, putting all the data on the reporting on early childhood issues of any kind to the Committee on the Rights of the Child in the recent, I mean, uh, since 2002. And you can see that relatively very limited number, this is only uh, Europe, EU, not even Europe, EU. So what we, what, 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 uh, we were counting on how many uh, times and in which country's case has ever early childhood issues mentioned in the concluding observations or in the reports. And you can see that it's relatively minimal. It's not a very high number. Uh, it's growing, and it's also a good sign. And obviously, we have to do this uh, exercise for entire Europe and also um, uh, outside Europe. But um, we haven't had the capacity to do that yet. If you are looking at the issues on the reporting, and this is, I guess, extremely interesting, what was mentioned in the most cases in relation to early childhood um, uh, development. The, the, the vast majority of uh, issues was alternative care, and this is important to recognize that children in public care are separated from their children due to abandonment, neglect, or abuse was mentioned 27%, um, um, which is one fourth of the cases. Uh, as victims of violence, abuse, and neglect, another 18%, which is quite high. Children with disability, 16%, also very important. Children with minority background, 19%, very, very high. Child poverty, 9%. Migrant asylum seeker unaccompanied children, 11%. This means what is the focus, at least in the EU countries, on the issues that are the most relevant and most striking when it comes to early childhood. If you are looking from the early childhood education and care perspective, we would get a very different uh, chart, ob obviously, because those children who are attending regularly early childhood settings are those children who don't uh, suffer in most cases with these kind of issues. So this is a, um, a, a, a kind of contradiction and something we should take into consideration how to uh, proceed and how to be 
as many, many of the workshops have tackled, and also yesterday, the plenary, this issue, how could we focus more on children in need, uh, and obviously not overlooking the needs of mainstream children or those who don't seem to be in any kind of trouble. There's not a question. The question is that in many countries like for instance, in Hungary, where the attendance in kindergarten is extremely high, 87%, uh, you would think that there are no, no issues. But obviously, those children who belong to these communities or who are struggling with these kind of problems are the ones who belong to the 13%. So they are the hard-to-reach children and families. And then the question is, how could we uh, change uh, uh, this situation? Now, as far as the reporting, um, um, yeah, yeah. What what I wanted to to uh, highlight is that early childhood care and education was only mentioned in four percent uh, of the cases, which means, which doesn't mean that this is not an issue in the countries. The question is how the government reports and the alternative reports are weighing this problem. So how much weight do they give to this problem, and how do they perceive? Uh, uh, the importance of it. And I guess this uh, should be challenged. Now, another chart we were putting together was on the recommendations on early childhood development by the committee to the countries. And this is, again, EU and not wider. It should be, but I'm sorry for next time I will put together all the rest. So what you can see that we made recommendations on um, on, and this is very important from the early childhood education and care perspective, the lack of capacity and low quality when it comes to the service provision to children. Uh, and this was 33%, uh, one third of the recommendations were focusing on lack of capacity and low quality to provide not only early childhood care and education, but also any kind of services to parents and young children between um, uh, zero and eight. Uh, the second one was on disability, because as we know in Europe, it is still a huge problem that children with disability are not integrated, are not having access to early childhood services. Uh, the next one was Roma children, which is in Europe Definitely, as we could see from the list of uh, workshops also here, many, many um, uh, are um, many on, on Roma issues, that Roma children were mentioned in 14%, just like disadvantaged children, other 14%, meaning uh, other issues, although uh, I can imagine that there are some overlaps here, um, but we try to select them out. And rural children, who again are extremely important because they don't have access to proper services and um, they are living in remote and isolated areas where not only they are isolated but also their families. And this means that the families don't get support, not only the children don't get support. And what we find more and more since the crisis that not only the children and the families are becoming poorer and poorer, but also the local authorities, the service providers, and even the professionals themselves. It is a devastating picture if you are looking, for instance, on the pay rise or the lack of pay rise among professionals working with young children. They should be the best paid and high, most highly qualified and respected people because we know from brain research, from all the evidence, that this is the most important period of life. And I'm always saying that although we at the university are not overpaid, and this is an understatement, but even so, compared to those working in early childhood settings, working in services for young children, you can see the preferences of the policymakers and the politicians, and it should be the other way around, not decreasing the payment for those who are working in tertiary education or secondary, but obviously uh, increasing the wages and also the prestige of those um, uh, working um, in the early years. Now, I would like to focus a little bit on the EU policies in this respect um, uh, in my Eurochild hat, if you like, or because I'm coming uh, from this region. As you probably know, there was a very strong recommendation made uh, by the European Commission last February uh, by the DG Employment and Social Affairs on investing in children in the EU. And we are very proud that this um, uh, 
is a very strong rights-based recommendation uh, uh, made on investing in children in a very holistic way. So although the, the, the title of it um, uh, gives the impression that it's about the future investment approach, but in fact, if you are reading the, um, uh, the recommendation, you can see that it's very complex, very holistic, and looking at all the needed aspects of um, uh, child development, although the EU, as we all know, hasn't got a competency in most of these areas because these are national competencies. But the important thing is that it is recognizing and acknowledging the need for better family policies in all the member states that are taking into consideration the need for much, much stronger parenting support and not only from the perspective of the reconciliation of family, private, and working life, which is the most often quoted uh, element, but also looking at the um, parent support uh, from the parenting capacity perspective, because parenting has become more and more demanding, and there is a kind of uh, expectation that everyone should be a perfect parent from the minute the child was born. And as we all know from our own experiences, that's not so. And we would need, should need, uh, to provide um, an ongoing support to the parents to fulfill uh, their obligations. Also, the recommendation is focusing on breaking the cycle of poverty. And we know that early childhood services are one of the best uh, opportunities to break the cycle of, of, of poverty, especially if we can uh, provide accessible um, and affordable, preferably cheap, uh, or very uh, or free, uh, very good quality um, um, uh, services, and it's not only the daycare, but all the family support services and child support services that are enabling um, the children to fulfill their full potential and develop accordingly. Another very important um, activity, uh, this is um, uh, Eurochild driven, although it is in, uh, in uh, full compliance with the EU policies, is the Opening Doors uh, campaign on deinstitutionalization of children. As everyone in Europe uh, is aware of the fact that, especially in the new member states and the um, so-called former socialist countries, but also in many, many very well-developed rich countries, institutionalization of young children is still a very striking issue. Um, uh, they are over 800,000 children in the region still in institutions, many of them under the age of eight, living with disabilities in very, very harsh circumstances. So therefore, the EU policy on deinstitutionalization and its implication on early childhood development is absolutely essential, especially because it is not clearly acknowledged by many member states that actually if you are closing the institutions, it can only be a successful exercise if we are setting up prior to that and parallel to it very high quality local services. If we are not doing that, we can easily fail and that, that would be a disaster for everybody. Because closing down institutions is not an issue anymore. I mean, it's evident, obvious for everybody that the impact of uh, institutionalization of children is devastating. And um, based on the brain research, based on all the evidence we know, and based on, on the very, very sad uh, experiences this region has, um, uh, has got, we know that no child should be placed in institution, whatever happens under a certain age. It depends whether in some countries it's three, in other countries six, in Hungary in principle it should be 12, but it's not happening. Um, but the, 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 the question is, what are we offering replacing the institutions, how can we provide the best possible preventive and early intervention services locally to the families, to the children, and early childhood education in care is one of the most important elements of it, obviously, but not without the parents, not against the parents, as in many countries in the region, they would love to see it, that they are rescuing children from the home from the family so that they should spend the longest possible time in the daycare because that's not what we are talking about. What we are talking about is a partnership with parents, empowering of parents. 
So our Opening Doors campaign now run in 12 countries, not only the EU, but also accession countries, by Eurochart in um, cooperation with Hope and Homes for Children, is aiming this very holistic, complex approach, and not only focusing on the closure of the institutions. Another very important issue uh, in re uh, regard <clears throat> the deinstitutionalization is the mythology in the region also about placing, uh, replacing um, uh, the institutions with foster families. Now, our aim would be to strengthen the notion that the primary role is to strengthen biological families, to help them being able to take good enough care of their children, and also strengthening kinship care provisions, obviously with the same uh, needed uh, support provided to kinship cares, to families, um, and there is a constant shortage of foster parents in the region, but also throughout uh, the world now. So we have to be very cautious when we are just thinking in a mechanical way that we are closing institutions and placing children into foster care, because it can be a huge failure and a shocking uh, tragedy for, for the children. Now, when it comes to reconciliation of family, private, and working life, we can see that the EU policies have always been, and Nora Milotai was talking about it, are, have been uh, focusing primarily on the daycare as a kind of storage place for children until the parents are away. We know that the, the big step taken was in 2011, when during the Hungarian presidency, actually the EU was launching the quality targets on early childhood uh, education and care, um, acknowledging the need for high quality services for all, not only for the vulnerable children, but obviously with special focus on those children who are most often excluded, discriminated again, and segregated. And especially in this part of Europe, it is extremely important to point out that um, the early childhood de uh, development can only be ensured if it, is, it has got an integrated um, approach. And it's not only serving those children who otherwise would be excluded, but the entire community and also other children who are more uh, fortunate or are living in more advantageous situations. Uh, because as we heard, um, um, you cannot avoid meeting those other uh, children in the other communities um, uh, living in harsh conditions, and it is only the benefit of, uh, of the well-off children if they are learning solidarity, cooperation, and um, um, uh, working together with everybody um, else. Now, there was another very interesting uh, uh, initiative made by um, 23 European networks, civil society organizations. Uh, uh, we made a commitment to end child poverty and promote child well-being across Europe by encouraging full implementation of this investing uh, in children breaking the cycle of disadvantage recommendation. And I have to emphasize that this is a recommendation, so it's also in your hands how strongly are you working on advocacy to convince the politicians and policymakers that although it's a recommendation only, they should implement it properly. Now, the Alliance mission is to promote child-centered quality and comprehensive policies by providing expert support in the development of the EU and national policies, legislation, and funding programs, including very strongly early childhood development issues and early childhood um, rights-based uh, care and education. Now this, um, obviously, whoever feels that uh, would like to know more about the Alliance and be part of it, um, uh, you are more than welcome. And obviously we hope that not only within Europe, but we can advertise it, so to say, also outside Europe and making it known. Because I can imagine, I know that in other regions like Africa, Latin America, there are very similar alliances operating. But still, it would be un uh, very good to learn from each other and understand who is doing what. Another kind of pioneering action was taken uh, by um, 14 international and European child rights NGOs, organizations. Um, that was launched last year on the 20th of November, which is the celebration of the Convention and the Child Rights. And this was a, a, an initiative to challenge um, the 
future and current members, or the at the time members of the European Parliament, we sent them a child rights manifesto and asked the, them to uh, commit themselves that once they are becoming members of the European Parliament, <coughs> they are working on a child rights based um, um, approach and they are prioritizing children more explicitly in EU policies, which would be um, extremely important. Also the funding and legislation and for the systemic um, assessment of the impact of the EU actions on children because it's very fragmented. Oftentimes the different DGs are not knowing about each other activities. They are not coping uh, properly. Now, it was very interesting, um, also from a research point of view, and we are still working on the, um, on the um, evaluation of the outcomes, that the Child Rights Manifesto campaign was partly an advocacy campaign and awareness raising campaign. We wanted the M members of the parliament and also the future members of the parliament be aware of the need to focus on children, but also wanted to engage them. Now out of the, I can't tell you the exact numbers, but there were thousands of people who were possibly uh, elected to the, from the 28 member states, 400 and, uh, 347 MEPs and candidates committed themselves. We can say that it's a very low number, but at least it was 347. I was a little bit disappointed how brave these people were not even responding to us. Actually, uh, as I'm a bad girl, I was doing that during the Hungarian elections. I was sending it to all the Hungarian MPs and the... Uh, Perspective, uh, members of the parliament, it, it was a devastating outcomes. I don't even tell you the numbers. But to be positive and uh, looking for the future, the good news is, if you like, that out of the 750 something new members of the European Parliament, we've got 90 child rights champions. So we call them now child rights champions because they committed themselves that they will represent children's issues and we can approach them and we can have an ongoing contact with them and we can rely on them and we hope uh, that they will be our allies in the parliament when it uh, uh, becomes to child rights and child related issues. Um, you're a child. Um, oh no, um, that's still the opening doors. I won't talk about it because I included in uh, in my previous um, um, slide. What I would like to um, uh, tell you is that uh, Eurochild was issuing a statement on early childhood development recently on the occasion of the Greek presidency, um, and we were we were pointing out the need for an European early childhood education and care policy based on early childhood developmental needs to consider the principles for early childhood policies in Europe. Um, that early childhood should be understood as a public responsibility and a public good, which I guess is not so obvious in many countries still, that a comprehensive early childhood policy requires holistic and integrated policy developments, not only focusing on narrow areas, that support for parents is a primary uh, <coughs> uh, consideration as the primary caregivers are absolutely critical, and also this means um, family support, that a competent early childhood workforce requires competent systems that are supporting them and backing up uh, them in all means, and that evaluation and research need to focus on children's outcomes, uh, I mean the um, outcomes of the uh, interventions and the activities in the present and the future are absolutely paramount if we are taking ourselves and uh, the children um, seriously.